In this second of two lectures on ecosystem ecology, Dr. Wendy Silver provides specific examples of ways to measure and conceptualize complex changes in ecosystems. She notes that ecosystem function will be defined by the availability of the most limiting resource and that over time the limiting resource will change. She presents several examples of ecosystem properties or components that play a different limiting role depending on the spatial and temporal context. She then discusses the data challenges and opportunities associated with combining simulated models and field data, and notes the potential scale mismatch between these data and analyses. She also reflects on the contributions that can be made by ecosystem ecology to environmental restoration and conservation, and highlights that ecosystem ecology can help answer current questions about how and why a current ecosystem functions. Why doesn't CO2 have a uniform effect on plants? It's a resource, right? Well, there can be other things that are going on. Ecosystems are incredibly complex. Um, and I think ecosystem ecologists are a little crazy because we embrace that complexity. We love that chaos and are trying to figure out, oh, you know, this isn't going to work because I forgot to think about that or I forgot to think about this. That's kind of what ecosystem ecology um, is all about. So one of the real interesting findings came from Steve Long's work um, in crop fields. They did an, a, a phase experiment, elevated CO2, and what they found, um, which I think people kind of knew, but they didn't know how, how significant the effect would be, is that CO2 increase induced the model closure. Um, stomates are the little pores on the undersides of leaves through which water and gas exchange. So stomates are really important, that's where CO2 goes in to plants and water. Uh, comes out, water vapor comes out, water escapes when those pores are open. Um, and what people know now is that when you elevate CO2, plants don't need to keep their stomates open so much, right? Because they're getting more CO2, they don't need to take in so much. Uh, you know, they don't have to have them open to get some more CO2. So, so their stomates close. And one of the things that that does is improve the water use efficiency by plants. And so a lot of the early CO2 Elevated CO2 studies were saying, well, look at this, isn't it great? Elevated CO2 is actually going to make uh, water use more efficient by plants, very plant-focused. But if you think outside of the plant, what happens when you decrease plant water loss? Well, water, plays, uh, uh, water loss from plants plays a pretty important role physically on ecosystems in cooling, right? Water loss, water vapor loss in ecosystems cools ecosystems. And so when you decrease water loss, you increase heating. And this is an image that shows a heat map that shows that the elevated CO2 sites were significantly warmer than the ambient sites because stomachs were closed. We didn't get that, that water vapor cooling, that late heat flux. And so the plants heat heated up. And plants are not always happier when they're hotter. And in this case, the plants, act, plants actually grew less under elevated CO2 because they were heated. Nutrients and water can also make a difference. So this is data from a recent paper that, uh, that uh, Rachel published in Nature of Science, uh, where they did, uh, in a grassland system, they, they had a lot of replicate plots. They ran, they ran this experiment for a long time, where they had um, elevated and ambient CO2 plots. And in grasslands, of course, you can replicate because the plot sizes are much smaller because the vegetation is much shorter so you get higher replication. Um, they had reduced rain and ambient nitrogen, reduced rain and enriched nitrogen, and in every combination that they could think of, right? And what they found was that when, when, when water and nitrogen were at their low levels, in this case, this is a, a low nitrogen environment, so when water and nitrogen were at their low levels, there's no effect of elevated CO2. And they only began to see an effect of elevated CO2 when one of the other resources were increased in availability. And in fact, when both, you get, when both resources were increased in availability, they got a little bump. Although it's a little misleading because their control site also got a little bit of a bump. Okay. And this gets into uh, an important concept in ecosystem ecology, which is Liebig's Law of the Minimum. And Liebig's Law of the Minimum is that it's not the total amount of resources that matter but it's the availability of the most limiting resource that matters. And you can think of it, they call it this Liebig's barrel, that the lowest stage is really what's controlling how full the, that, how full the barrel can be, right? It's that lowest stage where water begins to leak out. And so in ecosystem ecology, we tend to think about 
what's the most limiting resource, and as you increase the availability of any other given resource, a new resource will become limiting. So in agricultural ecology and in other aspects of ecosystem ecology, people in the North Temperate Zone in particular have focused on nitrogen availability because we live in places that have experienced glaciation and in uh, places that have experienced glaciation, um, we've, we, we have uh, gotten rid of, glaciers have gotten rid of all the buildup of soil nitrogen that we had. Soil, ni nitrogen is different than other uh, elements and that it comes primarily from the atmosphere and not from rocks. And so it takes time, all nutrients take time to build up, but <coughs> grinding the rocks is not going to do much for, for uh, nitrogen. You have to bring it in through biological processes, primarily nitrogen fixation, lightning fixes a tiny bit of nitrogen, but most of it comes in through biological processes. So you need to have biology there for a long period of time to really pull nitrogen into the environment. And so in the North Temperate Zone, we tend to focus on nitrogen because most of our ecosystems have low nitrogen. When you fertilize these ecosystems with nitrogen for long enough, you run out of another nutrient, usually phosphorus. And that's why farmers use whole nutrient sweets when they fertilize instead of just fertilizing mostly with nitrogen. Most of the fertilizers that farmers grow, farmers uh, purchase, are, are nutrient sweets because of Liebig's law of the minimum. So Liebig's law of the minimum applies to climate change or CO2, uh, elevated CO2 as well, that you can increase elevated CO2, but there are other things that are likely to become important. Um, carbon dioxide is only one resource that plants need to go with grow, but not the only resource. Nitrogen, water, phosphorus, other nutrients, temperature, physical stability, light, all of these things are important and, uh, and are important ecosystem characteristics that control rates of plant growth, pathogen, pathogen, pathogens and disease, herbivory, Toxic chemicals and disturbance um, are also important and will affect the response to elevated CO2. And we haven't even started to talk about the heterotrophic activity. So this equation deals with, or this equation is trying to predict net ecosystem production, right? Net ecosystem production, the total amount of carbon stored by the ecosystem, not just the total amount of carbon stored by plants. And studies are only really beginning to look at what the effects of elevated CO2 are on other components of this equation, particularly heterotrophic respiration. And there was a really intriguing uh, title at the ESA meetings a couple of weeks ago that was uh, significant um, effects of elevated CO2 on heterotrophic processes and microbial community composition. And I sat and thought, wow, we tend not to think about that because because microbes, most uh, heterotrophs, well, all heterotrophs, don't use CO2 directly as a resource. Most, I should say, don't use CO2 directly as a resource, right? And so, for at least for gaining energy, they don't use it for gaining energy. And so, I thought, well, what would be the effects of elevated CO2 on microbial community composition and microbial activity that could be back to affect this NEP equation? And it's not direct, it's all indirect. So it turns out that when you bathe plant leaves in elevated CO2, it changes their biochemistry. Makes sense, right? You're shifting their chemical, their, 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 the chemistry of the environment that they're in, so their chemistry is going to shift. And it affects how much carbon leaks out their roots into the soil. And that then feeds back on how much carbon is available to the microbes that are living in that soil. And, of course, it also affects the carbon to nutrient ratios and the quality of that carbon. What does that carbon look like? Not all carbon compounds are created equal. Some of them are easier to eat and some of them are less easy for microbes to eat. And so that's going to favor some microbial communities and populations over others. This is where we get into population and community ecology. And some of that's controlled by evolution. Right? How have they evolved in the past to, to deal with this? Have they seen similar situations like this down through evolutionary time, or is this a brand new novel environment for them, and how are they going to respond to that? That's going to shift their composition and their activity, which is going to ultimately affect how much carbon goes out back into the atmosphere. And so what we find is that there's these really interesting indirect effects of elevated CO2 that feed back on microbial community structure and function, and how much CO2 leaves the ecosystem. The temperature effects have their own impacts on microbial community structure and function, as well as chemical reactions in the soil. So how long is that carbon going to stick around 
versus how long is it going to stay, how sticky that carbon is, right? Is it going to react with mineral surfaces and react with each other, or is it going to be floating freely in the water? All of that can be affected by climate, can be affected by microbial activity. So that's all going to feed back on this net ecosystem production equation too, and we're just literally beginning to scratch the surface. And to make it more complex, but more interesting as well, is now, as I said before, we're realizing that ecosystems are, have this dimension that we haven't considered. So most studies in ecosystem ecology go down 15 or 20 centimeters into the soil. But now, through isotope techniques, we're able to trace the carbon that was produced up here and find it way down here. And we're able to produce carbon, we're able to identify carbon that was produced 5,000 years ago and see it you know, stored in microbes that were born yesterday. We're seeing how carbon is moving through those environments. So lots of really interesting tools. And then one other dimension that I want to add to this, because we're talking a lot about spatial scaling, but temporal scaling is also really important. Some of the early studies on elevated CO2 showed an increase in plant growth, especially when other resources were not limiting. A recent study that came out in Nature from tropical forests where we don't have a lot of base experiments is showing that the net biomass change in, in, um, in tropical forests in the Amazon primarily is, it, is, is, is um, misleading. It's the net biomass is actually declining. And again, this has huge implications because the tropics while making up only about 25% of the land area, cycle a huge proportion of the Earth's carbon because there's no winter dead season, right? There's no dormant season for tropical forests, humid tropical forests. So they're going all year long. Huge biomass, huge intake of CO2. People call the Amazon the lungs of the Earth and they're not far off from that. There's a lot of carbon that's stored in plants and soils in, in tropical forests globally. If those trees are growing less, and this is primarily due to mortality. So it's not just that the trees are going less, we're seeing higher rates of mortality in tropical trees, and we're storing less carbon in those environments, and that carbon is going back into the atmosphere. Right? So what's driving that? You know, we thought that elevated CO2 was potentially going to increase tropical forest growth, but instead what we're seeing on a net basis is that the biomass in tropical forests is actually declining. But this was actually in long-term plots that the, a, a large project called Rainforest has been measuring now for a couple of decades. And what, what they think is driving this is drought. Is that this, these are legacy effects or long-term effects of drought events. So drought kind of hammers trees and plants, but they don't necessarily die instantaneously, especially these long-lived organisms. They don't die instantaneously. It's kind of like being exposed to radiation, you're probably you know not going to die tomorrow unless you're really fried. But you know you may not live till you're 100 either, right? You might die when you're 50, as opposed to being dying, as opposed to having a lifespan that's much longer. Well, drought has a similar kind of effect on these plants, especially in environments that where they where they've never experienced these conditions in the past, right? And now we're getting lots of new novel disturbances, new novel conditions, new novel communities that we haven't seen before and with new novel behavior. So it's very hard to predict what's going to be happening in the future, but the temporal component is very important. You know, we're, we're getting a handle on that through long-term studies. The other way that we're, we're, we're playing with this is through modeling, is to try to extrapolate out into the future well, what are the conditions going to be like. And of course, we can't, there's a lot of uncertainty that goes into those models. But it does give us particular trajectories to begin to focus our efforts. Um, so there's always a risk involved. So, and exactly, how far does that uh, water use efficiency go in helping? You know, would, do we expect them to be maybe more, more, more drought resistant, but are they going to be drought resistant enough to make a difference? This is something that Margaret and I were talking about um, over the break, is that one of the things we've been doing in our lab that's been really, really interesting has been life cycle assessment modeling and sensitivity analysis within those life cycle assessments um, and finding that some aspects of, of, of ecosystem change or ecosystem variability that we thought were likely to be really critical to our bottom line turned out not to be important. 
that we could be a thousand a, a thousand percent off, not really, probably more like three to four hundred percent off before it makes a difference. And so to, to our bottom line. So this so water use efficiency may be one of those issues that we may be increasing water use efficiency by five, ten percent, but is that enough when you get you know an increase in drought that's on the scale of 30, 40, 50 percent? So I'm in the, in the midst of writing a paper, which will hopefully be, be submitted very soon, where we've taken a, a global scale data set. And this is, again, one of those scaling issues. So there was a group of, uh, a group of people. I was actually a graduate student when this project started, so I, I have benefited. I have one science paper and, and, and several, I think five or six others that came from data that I never even touched the samples of. So this just goes to show you. Don't be shy of for, about asking for the data. So a lot of times people just hand it over. Um, they weren't doing anything with it. Um, it was a, a large-scale long-term decomposition experiment. So it started out with the Long-Term Ecological Research Network. Somebody came up with an idea that let's do, let's get a whole bunch of leaves from a lot and roots from, from different ecosystems, but, but uh, the, the same leaves. So, so for example, uh, in Puerto Rico, one of my field sites, they collected the leaves and roots from Drypedes glauca. They could get a lot. And they got a lot, bags and bags and bags of that. All of that went to Oregon State and was distributed out to, oh, I think in the end about 30 different ecosystems where people put litter bags, these, these little mesh bags, out onto the ground and into some of the streams in some places um, and, and uh, conducted a 10-year experiment. So thousands upon thousands of these bags went out. And when they came back, there were certain things that people had to do with them, and then they sent it back to Oregon State where they compiled all the data. And of course, over the course of 10 years, and it took more like 15 uh, by the time everybody was done, um, people had lost interest, they had retired, they had moved on, they had changed their focus, and so this data set was just sitting there. And um, I had seen this, you know, I had been a beginning graduate student when it was started, and I had gone through my entire career, you know, graduate student, postdoc, assistant professor, and I'm seeing this data sitting there and nobody's doing anything with it. So I just asked, you know, could we have access to the data? And they said, absolutely, we'd love somebody to play with it. So we got a group of people together and did an NC's working group and, and cleaned the data up and started doing analyses on it. And one of the things we found were that there were interesting global patterns in decomposition. One of the things that came out of that was this really strikingly strong relationship between climate and decomposition rates at a global scale. We could explain 90% of the variability in global patterns of leaf litter decomposition based on a very simple equation that incorporated temperature and moisture and the potential evapotranspiration. So how much, what's the potential for water to evaporate out of an ecosystem? And very striking. So we then took that data, took that relationship, and we extrapolated back um, using the climate data 100 years we have globally gridded climate data through something called the crew data set over the last 100 years that has filled in using all the weather measurements that they could find to cover quite thoroughly the planet and what the climate has been for the last 100 years. And since climate was correlated with decomposition, litter decomposition, which leaves broke down, and roots, but much better for leaves. Um, we could say, well, this is the pattern. We think this is the pattern of decomposition over the last 100 years. And so we could look at how decomposition changed over the last 100 years and what it was most tightly correlated with. And one of the interesting things is it's very <coughs> tightly correlated with precipitation and temperature, but precipitation ends up being more important. The other thing that we did was over the last 30 years, uh, there's a since we've had satellite images and satellite records, we can extrapolate net primary productivity globally over the last 30 years. There's some issues with those data sets, but it's pretty tight. So we now took the last 30 years and we looked at how much leaf litter is coming in versus how much uh, leaf litter is decomposing. And we found they became decoupled. So there were some places where the rate of decomposition exceeded the rate of leaf litter input. And that's getting at that net ecosystem production term, right? So what happens when the rate of decomposition increases faster than the rate of leaf litter input? What are the options? <coughs> Soil loss? Soil carbon loss. We think that that's probably what's, gonna, what's happening. Is that once the microbes, the microbes are not starving to death, right? We would see complete ecosystem collapse because microbes were the world. 
So we know that if they're not collapsing, what are they eating? Well, they're probably chewing on soil carbon. Soil carbon pool is huge. The atmospheric pool is about 700 petagrams, 10 to the 15th grams. The soil carbon pool is easily three times that, at least, just in the surface. And so measuring that kind of a change is very hard at large spatial scales, but we think that that's happening. Now, it's interesting because the global models, that doesn't die with global models. Global models say we can't, we still have a land sink. And so that leaves us two options. The global models are wrong, or we're wrong. I guess there's three options. We could be wrong, the global models could be wrong, or there's another sink that we haven't on. encountered. And so it's probably some combination of those. But there's no reason to necessarily, you know, I got into a wonderful discussion with somebody recently who does the global modeling, and he said, we can't be wrong. I said, what's your uncertainty? And he went, well, okay, maybe we could be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so life cycle assessments are what people uh, consider this kind of cradle-to-grave modeling, where they, they um, try to follow material all the way through from the raw material or the, the initiation all the way through to whatever the end product is. So that's what it is really in engineering. So what we tried to do was do a life cycle assessment of um, a management approach on land to try to sequester carbon. And I'll talk about that tomorrow in our research. Um, and what, what that showed us, what, you know, if, if our end goal was to try to pull carbon out of the atmosphere to help slow climate change, um, we were looking ecologically, well, what were the components, you know, how did the, where did the, the carbon start with obviously being fixed by plants through photosynthesis? And it goes through the whole, all the different ecosystem compartments and eventually some of it gets stored and some of it gets released. Well, what we're really trying to figure out what is most important for figuring out, how to, getting the largest number, largest amount of carbon into the soil. And there were a lot of things that we thought were really gonna make a big difference, climate, you know, because at an ecosystem scale, temperature and moisture are important for carbon production, carbon storage. Um, but we, it turned out <coughs> that we could alter climate in the model and it didn't have anywhere near as big an effect as uh, potential sources of nitrous oxide emission. So we were looking at the net carbon benefit, which, which uh, it, uh, I should say the net climate benefit, which incorporates both the CO2, but also, or not both, but the CO2, nitrous oxide, and methane as well as the, the solid carbon that's fixed in the environment. And what we found was that global warming potential just blows you out of the water. It only takes a little bit of nitrous oxide to, to offset a lot of CO2 gain. And so again, you know, you have to think of, you have to take a systems approach or you end up solving one problem. And in our case, we were solving one problem, but creating another problem that we didn't even realize until we started to make the measurements. So adding, for in our example, adding cow manure onto landscapes, taking it out of the waste stream, where it was a big producer of greenhouse gas, putting it onto landscapes, which is a common practice globally, uh, increases soil carbon storage tremendously and increases plant growth, but it increases nitrous oxide emissions tremendously. The resolution that we can now achieve with global models is better than we can actually achieve with global models. So in other words, our satellite imagery can give us vegetation at relatively small spatial scales on the scale of meters. Um, however, this, we have a, a disconnect with scaling um, that up from a carbon perspective or nitrogen or whatever other biogeochemical parameter you're interested in, CO2. And it becomes what, what my colleague works on, which is called the big leaf model. It becomes one big leaf, or we call the green slime model which is basically treated as green slime that all behaves in a similar way. And there are armies of people out there who are trying to improve upon that. And we can take, for example, boreal forests and tune the knobs so that the boreal forest acts more like boreal forest and tropical forest acts more like tropical forest. What we can't do is say, oh, this region of boreal forest that turns out to be growing on a different geology and thus has different behavior we don't have that the ability in the models yet, in the, in the global scale models, to tune the models to, to behave differently. Those models aren't yet responding to geology. Um, they respond, and they don't really even respond to nutrient availability yet. yet. But we're getting there, because the regional and 
ecosystem scale models are getting fairly good from that perspective. You know, fairly good is plus or minus 25% from the field measure data. Realize that the error bars on our field measure data are fairly large. So we're getting close to being within the realm of believability. Um, but I caution people to, to rely too heavily on models because we're creating novel conditions and novel ecosystems. And so we don't really know. We can never really get away from that, those field experiments because the field experiments are going to help us with those surprises that the models, the models are only as good as the information that we have. I mean, the models can surprise us too when we put parameters together that we don't know of, but they're going to behave, those large scale models behave mathematically, right? Even though we, we throw some chaotic components into that, it's still going to be mathematically that they're, they're behaving. Whereas the biology, even though in theory you could boil it down to a set of equations, there's, the complexity is so great that we can never necessarily predict how things are going to respond to novel conditions. I'm working with Andy Jones. I don't know if you know him, but he's at, he's at um, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And he's trying to put um, society into GCM. And so a human behavior component, but also try to try to um, take all that data that people are collecting from uh, how human behavior affects the flow of carbon and nutrients in environments and put it into the global the global models. And of course, it's very primitive at this stage, but it's a first step, right? There's a large group of microbial ecologists who are who are still spending a lot of time trying to put names to organisms. Um, and uh, there's another group of people that are uh, looking at the genes of these organisms and trying to understand if we can link those genes to function. Because um, in some ways, just getting a set of genes, being able to rapidly assess genes, um, could potentially tell us something about what they're capable of. And we won't have to worry about who they are or what combination those genes are occurring in. Um, the problem with microbes is that they evolve very quickly. That also makes it very exciting. Um, where I sit as an ecosystem ecologist, I think um, I have tremendous respect for microbes and they're, they're what, they're, what they can do. But to me, their identity is less important. I think we can measure what they do through the ecosystem processes that we measure. I can measure nitrogen cycling at the plot scale and a little bit with satellites. I can measure their carbon dynamics, same scales. Um, you know, I can measure shifts in greenhouse gases, which are they're primarily responsible for. And so, to me, it matters less who they are, but more what they can do. And um, there's now more and more experiments, people trying to push microbial communities to their edges to find out where their edges are and what their what their behavior is. And one of the most exciting things I think we're seeing are threshold responses. So, so in, in ecology, people are always looking for linear relationships because they're the simple to understand. If we have A and B and B is varying, it's really nice when we get nice straight lines, right? Because then we can come up with simple equations to help predict the behavior of A from B. Um, what we're seeing in, in ecosystem ecology um, and other fields as well now, with, with kind of the creation of all these novel environments, is it, it's forcing people to try to tr understand, well, how are things changing with changing conditions? And what we're seeing are things like this. These big threshold responses. You know, or... You know, curvilinear polynomial responses. One of the things that we've seen that's really interesting collaborating with microbial ecologists is that this will be the ecosystem process, you know, that we're seeing. And we'll look at the microbial community and it's doing this, you know. <laughs> and it just evens out, right, over time. But we're seeing huge fluctuations in the microbial community composition over time. So it's really interesting. So you can have very simplified questions. What's the relationship between nitrate and nitrous oxide emissions? Nitrate is one of the precursors to nitrous oxide. So if my ecosystem, if, if my question about my ecosystem is, I want to understand the nitrous oxide budget from the, of this ecosystem, 
and I think nitrate concentrations that are coming in from upslope agriculture through the stream water are driving this. Then I model it in terms of nitrate input and the relationship between nitrate and nitrous oxide. Okay. Right? It ends up being a lot more complex than that because we find that, oh, well, it's just not nitrate alone. Carbon concentrations actually play a role. So you need to bring in some other parameters. But there are some questions that you can, you know, relatively simply, you know, you come up with relatively simplified models and, and, and get fairly close across a wide range of conditions, wide range of ecosystems, wide range of conditions. For example, global scale decomposition. This model that we put together for understanding decomposition globally, leaf layer decomposition, well, it works at a global scale. It doesn't work within sites, because of course within sites, climate is all the same. So there are other factors within sites that are controlling it, but my question is at a global scale, I can actually use a linear relationship and explain 90% of the variability. One question you asked that I think is really important is how do humans come into this? And for me, humans are part of it. And so, so just in the same way, and I've been accused as, as an ecosystem ecologist of, 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 of being a species hater. I'm not a species hater. <laughs> I'm not a species hater. I just don't feel like I necessarily always need to know the name of the organism that, that, that's, that's producing the carbon or consuming the carbon or nitrogen or whatever it is that we're working on. Um, there are, there's a lot of redundancy in ecosystems. Redundancy meaning that there are multiple organisms that can do essentially the same thing. And if you lose one, in some cases, especially in a diverse tropical forest, you lose one, you may not be able to detect a difference in function. Or you, call, you shift one, I know this is scary, isn't it? You shift one out and you bring another one in, you may not be able to detect a difference in function at an ecosystem scale. That doesn't mean that that species doesn't have value. And there may be, there may be many different ways you can value that species. But from a carbon cycling, nitrogen cycling perspective, we may not be able to detect an effect. Of, of changing that, that composition or even losing certain species in some cases. You know, where, where do humans come into this? Well, hu you know, humans are absolutely fundamental in, in my thinking of ecosystems. I do a lot of work, you know, I have this, I was telling somebody I have a, I have a ridiculously diverse research program right now um, where we do some very, very basic biogeochemistry on iron and redox. And then the other side of what we do is looking at cow manure and, and wetland, you know, carbon for AB32 in California and, you know, very directly rancher and policy maker involved. And in those projects, you know, human behavior is a fundamental component of that. The difference is, is that I'm taking, on, on one project, in the Delta project, we're taking human behavior as the, as the, the kind of state variable. This is human behavior. And so we'll look at, well, this is human behavior. What can we do with that? What, 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 how does that influence carbon and nitrogen flows in and out and, and greenhouse gas dynamics? Um, and then what happens if human behavior shifts? So we look at Rancher B or wetland mitigation protocol C, and we look to see, well, how does that affect carbon and nitrogen cycling patterns? So humans, you know, humans are a big piece of it from that perspective. Yeah. I'm thinking of, um, my, my, you know, my, the cattle ranchers that I'm working with, right? They're changing the stock of carbon in the soil. They're changing the stock of, of, of carbon and nutrients in the biomass through their management activities. Um, you know, they change the stock of biomass by just moving cows in and out, right? And of course, there is a flux. You could have the flux of cows in and out yeah. as well. It really boils down to, you know, systems thinking. How does the system function? And are there certain organisms within that system that are absolutely critical for this function if we value that function? You know, we take a very human perspective on how we look at ecosystems. And my postdoc mentor was Ari Lugo, who has a really different approach than a lot of ecologists in that his feeling is, wow, this is cool. We, we uh, you know, humans came in altered ecosystem behavior, removed all of these species, and we get a real shift in ecosystem behavior. We get a new ecosystem. You know, his colleagues got very upset and said, well, you shouldn't be focusing on that. You should be focused on the fact that these species went extinct. We lost them. And he said, yeah, we lost them, but, but the ecosystem still goes. It's just different. And so just different, again, different perspectives. It's not that, that it's not a problem that we lost these species. It's that, they, you know, is now behaving differently. So novel ecosystems are generally defined as new, uh, either 
they can be new combinations of species that have never that, that are there only because humans have modified the species composition either directly or indirectly. Through domesticated invasions. crops, for example. Domesticated crops invade you know created environments that, that facilitate invasion. Um, th that uh, you know brought you know brought yeah brought species in um, to new new environments. Um, it also can um, new new ecosystems can evolve because of changed environmental conditions. So there's been a lot of work done in urban ecosystems that have created environments that never occurred anywhere else on the planet as far as we know. And so this new combination of conditions has led to new behavior, new species composition, new cycling rates, different uh, patterns in storage and carbon and nitrogen in different places. But it's at least in part because of the human impact. Absolutely. I mean, I think humans are, are uh, instrumental. I think we can get novel ecosystems without human impact. It just happens much more slowly, the change. But I think humans have accelerated the development of new environments. Resistance is the ability of uh, organisms or ecosystems to resist change when, it, when you impose some sort of stressor on them. So they're going to just, you can hit them and they're just going to sit there. They're resisting. Resilience is the ability to absorb that and, and maintain homeostasis or some degree of continuity of function, right? So uh, they, they will be impacted by the disturbance, but they're going to come right back. Right? So that's, that's how you might define resilience. In some ecosystems, there may be species that have a disproportionate control on a function relative to their biomass or their abundance. And, and, and those are the ones that, you know, if we can identify those and, and know, especially if we're trying to minimize change, if that's a goal of, of, of society or of any group, is to minimize change, then we want to make sure that those species or those traits those characteristics that those species express is maintained in an ecosystem, right? It used to be that we always just focused on the species, and now people are really looking at traits. And those traits are the particular, and you know, as an ecosystem ecologist defining traits, but I would say it's the particular behavior characteristics, genetically based, is this true? It could be morphology, too. Yeah, morphology, okay, morphologically based, that, um, that you can define. You know, in and across species. So there are some traits that have, for example, deep rooting plants will cycle water differently than shallow rooting plants. So these traits have a have a, sometimes have a discernible impact on the ecosystem. So if again, if you're interested, for example, in human behavior, and and we um, we're deforesting species because we need the wood. Let's say we need that wood. You know, well, do we want to look at the traits and say, well, if we're picking certain species that have the same trait, what's the impact of that going to be on the ecosystem? You know, potentially we might lose the ability to cycle deep water, especially if we change the environment enough that it makes it very difficult for a new species to come in and exploit that open niche. These ecosystem services, I think, are really important. I mean, I think that's what, you know, society tends to look to, to our landscapes and to our ecosystems for those kinds of outputs. Um, the, the, again, as my mentor Ayalu likes to say, is that there's ecosystems everywhere. We won't get rid of ecosystems, they'll just change. You know, and we, you know, one of the experiments that was done at my field site way before I was there was, you know, they irradiated a piece of forest to try to understand what the effects of dropping an atomic bomb would be on forest ecosystems. And so they, they irradiated a piece of forest, and it, you know, it kind of wiped, killed all the plants in that vicinity of this radiation source. Okay, but there was still an ecosystem there. You know, there was things grew back. Took a while. There was, you know, microbial activity. It didn't create a completely sterile, non-living environment. Right? There was just a new ecosystem there. So ecosystems will persist. Um, uh, at least in the foreseeable future. <laughs> I'm sure there are ways you can try, you know, obliterate them, but I think will persist. The, the, um, from, a, from a societal perspective, you know, again, it's really the question, you know, what are our goals? Are our goals preserving biodiversity? Well, and then we have to say, well, what's the flavor of the biodiversity that we want to preserve? Do we want to preserve native species biodiversity? Is there a value that we as society hold on keeping those species there? Well, then I think you have to take an ecosystem perspective because you have to say, well, why are those species there? Is it just history? Is it a historical accident that those are the ones that are 
that they're there? Or is it a, are we looking at a point in time? This gets into restor the questions of restoration ecology, right? Are, if people have, have uh, if human activity has, has changed ecosystems in ways that people find no longer desirable, and they want to go back to a previous state, you have to figure out, well, why was that state there? Was it just part of a long-term temporal cycle, and we're saying we want to hit this part, and we want to maintain it, and not allow it to do what nature is trying to make it do? Well, that becomes a very big problem. You know, how do you fight natural cycles? And how do you alter those? I think it. I think we, we. You know, we have to take into consideration those parameters. I think we also have to take into consideration the fact that that you know the environment is changing and it is fluid, and so as we as we design ecosystems for human use, or if we dis, uh, devise goals that we want for ecosystems, you can't do that without considering the factors that, that drive ecosystem structure and function. How is climate going to affect this? How is, how is CO2, you know, elevated CO2 going to affect this? How is a whole second part that I didn't get into, nitrogen deposition, anthropogenic nitrogen deposition, how is that going to affect? Your ecosystem. These are things that are happening at large spatial scales that almost all ecosystems are, are affected by. And so if you decide to manage your ecosystem or design your ecosystem that don't, doesn't take into consideration these factors, you're going to fail, right? Because those are going to drive change, whether you like it or not. There's still a scale disconnect between what you can do with the, uh, and these large scale models and what we really understand happens at a plot scale or even a regional scale. Okay, so, so, so when we say they're wrong, you know, yeah, they're not getting all of those feedbacks yet. You know, the role of vegetation is hugely important, hugely important. Um, and and they re people recognize that. Um, there's been, there was really some interesting recent work looking at just albedo, the changes in the color of vegetation and how important that can be for driving global models. Dark vegetation versus light, right? Absorbing heat versus reflecting heat. And what kind of impact does that have? Um, the, you know, soil moisture. There's a lot of work going on in trying to understand how important soil moisture is for global models because of the latent heat flux issue, the, 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 the water vapor cooling effect. That's very big, as well as the fact that water vapor is a greenhouse gas. Um, so, so vegetation plays a very, very big role. Um, and again, you know, there's history involved. So who devised the idea of coming up with these global circulation models? Well, it was mostly atmospheric chemists and physicists. And they brought in vegetation because they knew it was important, but it was the green slime kind of vegetation. And now they're getting more and more and more sophisticated. People are linking models, where models that work well at the ecosystem to landscape scale are now getting linked to global models. And what it's doing is it's identifying new questions. So there are certain parts of the earth that we just don't understand very well. And um, hopefully that will focus research dollars into helping us improve our understanding of that. And then the other is, is that we don't understand the effects at a global scale of human behavior. And so that's why I think that, that what you guys are doing here and what we all, I think, are doing that, that's really an important step forward is, is looking at managed ecosystems. Um, most ecosystems are managed, but looking at how explicitly they're managed and what impact that has on, uh, on, on aspects outside of the ecosystem boundary. And then can we come up with behavioral, whether it's economic, social, political, behavioral indices that help us understand, you know, that feedback between land and atmosphere and oceans.